Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Welcome back to the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. Now, today, I want to talk about the year 2020. And I know that lots of you just gasped, thinking, please, no more 2020. Um, Either you're listening to this recording, and we're not done with it yet, or you're listening to it, and it's already passed, and you're just thinking, can I please forget the year? But I want to specifically talk about some of the big lessons that we have learned as a church that are important this year. Look, we've had COVID-19. We've had lockdowns. We have had businesses that have been destroyed. Families have been separated. It's been atrocious. We've had murder hornets. And just on and on and on. The year 2020 has been an insane year. For many people, it's been a very painful year. And we aren't done with it yet as of the time of this recording. However, there has been some good that's come from all this insanity. All this destruction that we've endured, there's been some good. Even in the midst of all of the turmoil, there's been some good. And it might seem like a strange thing to say, but this year has shown us some of the weaknesses found in the church like no other year in a generation or two. Well, how is that good? Well, it's good because it shows us what some of the things are that we need to address moving forward, and we need to not ignore these things. It gives us an opportunity to make a course correction in the Western Church, and it has been made evident um, of some things in which we really need to repent as a church. This is God's grace to us in 2020. This is God's loving kindness working in the midst of tragedy, revealing to us things that may have been continued um, undetected and to be corrosive for many, many years to come, and yet 2020 has exposed them with extreme prejudice. So, what are these things? Well, I just want to focus on one of the several themes I'm going to be doing over a few podcasts, and today, the first thing I want to touch on is ecclesiology. Now, ecclesiology is theology as it's applied to the nature, structure, and function of the Christian church, and what we've discovered in the year 2020 is that we have very poor ecclesiology in the American church. Think back to the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak. Now, it was understandable that we closed the churches in the beginning. We had a new virus with very little information about how bad it was going to be, how it was going to affect people. And so, rightfully, I believe many churches followed the government's mandates out of wisdom out of an abundance of caution for the sake of their people, and that was fine. Not a problem at all. But then, soon after, we began to see some huge inconsistencies in the mandates. Churches had to be closed, and yet liquor stores could be open. This is a problem, right? Churches had to be closed down, but marijuana dispensaries remained open. Churches were closed, but the murder of infants was deemed an essential service. Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter could march thousands strong, some tens of thousands strong, and yet if the church had more than 25 or 50 people, they would be violating um, mandates and putting whole communities at risk. Just didn't add up. Well, with these inconsistencies, which were major, became widespread, at that stage, churches should have opened. Now, some of them did. You know, I, I just think we, I'm, we are so grateful in the Western church for men like Tom Askell, for men like John MacArthur, and for lots of other Um, men who maybe don't have large platforms, but they saw those inconsistencies and they opened their church for the sake of their people. We are thankful to God for those men, but many, many did not open. And still today, at the point of this recording, many are still not open. 
Now, why is this, you might ask? I'd argue that it's because more pastors than we ever could have imagined, and certainly many Christians in America have poor ecclesiology. Many have a minimal view of the purpose and function of the church and therefore have little value for it. They may argue otherwise, but 2020 has proved them wrong. We have lots of buildings that have labeled themselves as churches, but what purpose do they really serve by being closed? Is the church not worth more than a liquor store? Well, if you look around at the responses of many churches, you would think not. Is the church not more essential than a marijuana shop? Which, by the way, is never essential. Are we to believe that strip clubs are to be open and simultaneously be satisfied with pastors closing their churches? Of course not. But this is what has been uncovered in 2020. A poor value for church. A poor understanding of the purpose and function of the church. Now, interestingly enough, anytime these things come up in this day and age, someone undoubtedly says, but the church isn't a building. Well, that's true, but also it's not. I mean, first and foremost, I don't know a single person who, when they talk about the church, believe that the church is merely made up of building materials. Nobody believes that the church is a stack of bricks, right? Some window seals some glass, some carpet, and a bunch of paint, a few pews. Nobody believes that. We understand that what we are referring to most often when we say church is a body of believers. And, well, or at least we assume that everyone realized this, understood this, but clearly 2020 has taught us differently. But what is worse than not understanding that the church can refer to the building believers meet in or... The believers themselves is that we don't realize in either case it's centered around a group of believers. It appears that in 2020, what many mean when they say, quote, but the church isn't a building, is that an individual can somehow be the church and that the church isn't necessarily a group of people that are supposed to gather together on a regular basis, sitting under the teaching and preaching of the word, taking the Lord's Supper together, fellowshipping with one another. And if you believe that you can be the church by yourself as you worship online, you would be sadly mistaken. And yet, this is what we see in 2020. We have had arguments from pastor after pastor after pastor, from dozens and hundreds and thousands of believers who go to these churches that are quite happy to say, I don't need to attend a church because I am the church. But they would be wrong. The church is a holy Christian congregation consisting of believers only who have been called to God by the work of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, who are separate from the world and are united in one spiritual body. The church is a holy congregation. The church is, in fact, and firstly, a congregation. One person is not and cannot be, quote, the church. Although this is clearly what we have learned that a great deal of professing believers and even many pastors seem to think these days, if you judge them by their actions. So we can look at scripture to find out how the church is referred to, and we're going to do that now because in scripture, the church is referred to in several ways, and and one thing that you'll notice, it never refers to the church is, it is as, as a individual. Ephesians 1, 22, 23 describes the church as a body. Well, a body's made of multiple parts, right? Not just one. One finger is not a body, one eye is not a body, one ear is not a body. It says this, And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 1 Peter 2.9 describes a church as a nation. 
one person is not a nation. We understand this, right? The passage reads this way, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2.5 describes the church as a house. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. John 10.16 describes the church as a flock. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. And in 1 Thessalonians 2.12, the church is referred to as a kingdom. But as Brackle rightly states, one stone does not constitute a house. One sheep does not constitute a flock. One member is not a body. One person is not a nation. And one person is certainly not a kingdom. Right? The point is that the church is an assembly, a gathered people. And if there's no gathering, then there's no church. That's not all the church is, but it's certainly never less. No wonder churches are still closed and so many professing Christians are content with we are the church so that they can just worship at home. Too many believe that the church consists of just one individual. This couldn't be further from the truth, and we've looked at many of the scriptures that describe the church. And some of the actual words used in Scripture for the church would also contradict what many seem to believe about the church in the year 2020. Let's take a look at those and see if they line up with some of the things that we've heard this year. Right, The word church shows up over 70 times in the Scriptures. It's transliterated from the Greek word kyrike. I may have pronounced that wrong, but it literally means that which belongs to the Lord. It's found in phrases like the day of the Lord and the Lord's Supper. And it's true for the church of the Lord. It's a congregation. Right? In the New Testament, the word church is often used. All right? When you go to the Old Testament, you more often find the word congregation. But here's the thing. They're synonymous and they're interchangeable. So we understand church to be a congregation, not an individual. Well, there are some other words used that express the church. In Scripture, we've all likely heard the word ecclesia, right? Um, we find it in 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. It says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. And he goes on. So here's the word ecclesia, it's translated as church, and it's understood to be gathered together. When you come together as a church, this is the expectation is that the church gathers. Right? So if you have a people who never gather, you, you would not call it the church. We don't get to use the phrase... Well, the church is in a building. I am the church. To justify staying at home on the Lord's Day, week after week after month after month, watching a sermon online and saying we had church this morning. And yet, this is what's happened all throughout the year 2020. These justifications that stem from a poor understanding of what the church is, of the function of the church, of the purpose of the church. So, come together in a building and call it church. That's an accurate statement. Meet together in a field and call it church. That, too, is accurate. But what is not accurate is being at home by yourself and saying, well, I am the church. Or, what's perhaps more prominent in 2020 is viewing an online sermon and saying, we had church. No, the church is the gathering of the saints. You only watched a sermon. Now, I'm not saying that you can't ever do that. But what I am suggesting is that gathering together with the saints on the Lord's Day should be a high 
priority and a high value. And 2020 has demonstrated that it is not for many, many of those who profess the name of Christ in the American church. Well, there's another word that describes the church as well in Scripture, and it really eliminates the argument of the church is not a building, which I'm just throwing this in. And by the way, that phrase is really disingenuous. Right, because it's most often just used to justify not going to Lord's Day service for whatever the reason is. Now, in our case, that reason has been safety, right? I don't want to catch the flu, so I'm just not going to go to church for eight months. Um, Totally unacceptable. Now, I'm not dealing with, you know, the few exceptions that could be legitimate, but as a general rule, no believer should think that way. Right. Anyway, um, the word there is found in James 2.2. 2. It says, For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes, and it goes on, you know the verse, but the word there used is synagogue. It's used here, translated as assembly, or in some translations, gathering. Sometimes the word in Scripture, synagogue, is actually referring to the congregation that gathers, and at other times it's referring to the building in which the congregation gathers. So, if you're a Christian that says the church is not a building, stop it. Because even the Bible uses the same word to describe both. And it always understands the meaning. And so do we. Right? We understand that when but we understand that whenever we talk about the church, right, ultimately it centers around the gathering of God's people. Whether you're referring to where they gather, right, or the gathering itself, the gathered church is this is the center of that. Now, the takeaway from all of this is that these words refer to the mutual fellowship of those who have been summoned together and gather with Christ as their head. The church gathers, right? The church gathers. It's really that simple. The church is a gathering, and if that isn't happening, then you aren't having church, you aren't being the church, right? You aren't being obedient to the expectations of God. God's expectations is that we gather together as the church. And the fact that so many churches are still closed demonstrates just how little we understand what the importance and the function of the church really is. I mean, it should be infuriating that we see strip clubs open and churches are closed. Casinos are open And the church is closed. Liquor stores are open. And the church is closed. Massive retail stores with hundreds and hundreds of people in the store are open. And yet we have pastors that are saying their church is closed for the safety of their people. Now, perhaps it's better if those so-called worldly consumer-driven churches just stay closed. And for the others, it's time to open your church. And for those who may listen to this message in the future, keep your church open. Listen, the California governor seems to think that it's okay to have his own private parties without any social distancing or masks. The Nevada governor seems to think that he can take his family out without masks or social distancing. When the media, listen, when the media announced that Joe Biden was the projected was projected to win the electoral college, It was seemingly okay for thousands to gather in the streets, sharing open bottles of wine between strangers and singing at the top of their lungs. Pastors, open your church. The church is essential. And what we have learned in 2020 is that perhaps the majority of, of professing believers in America do not actually believe that the church is essential. The fact that so many are closed not only demonstrates our poor ecclesiology, 
but it demonstrates also the fact that we have far too many weak men in the pulpit who have either no understanding of the role as a shepherd or they take it lightly and in either case an unwillingness to resolve that should end in a new career for that pastor the role of an elder a pastor overseer is to feed the sheep to shepherd the flock of god and clearly the western church has little understanding of how we do this you can't do it if your church has been closed for eight months It's pretty hard to care for God's people if you have no contact with them. It's also hard to care for God's people as a shepherd if you remove all the ordinary means of grace that God has given to them. It's more the work of the devil to eliminate the ordinary means of grace than it is the work of a good shepherd. I mean, a shepherd who keeps his people from sitting under the preaching of the word is not a shepherd. A shepherd who keeps his people from praying together as a congregation is not a shepherd. A shepherd who keeps his people from gathering together to receive communion is unworthy of being called a shepherd. Folks, in 2020, we've seen the suicide rates climb. Alcohol and drug abuse is increasing. Domestic violence is on the rise. Believers are feeling vulnerable, isolated, anxious, and fearful. They need the word of God. They need communion. They need the corporate prayer. They need an open church. Because church is essential. Because ecclesiology is important. Good ecclesiology, that is. I think the problem that we have seen in 2020 is that physical health is seen as being far more superior than that of sitting under the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. That physical safety is more important than being obedient and gathering together as the church, and that demonstrates a deficiency in theology proper. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, here's the reality, folks, and I I get it. It's a hard reality, maybe, for some. I find great rejoicing in it, but here's the reality. God is sovereign. Not one person will fall ill other than that that did not fall into God's ordained plan. I can't tell you how or why. That's not for us to know, right? The, the secret counsels of God's will, we don't, we don't get to know those things, but God is sovereign. No one is going to be exposed other than that that fits in God's plans and purposes. And yet we've seen in the church believers shrink back and walk away from the very things that God commanded us to do as a church to try to safeguard their own safety And after we have come to realize that we have over a 99.9% survival rate, right? So it's not like 50% are going to die to get exposed to this thing, right? 99.9%, we know this, the numbers are clear, they're out there, and yet we have professing believers doing everything they can do to not be a part of what God called us to be a part of, his gathered church. Now, I'm not suggesting that we ignore reasonable precautions, right? But we can by no means keep people from that which God himself ordains, the gathering of the saints to worship him, the gathered church is where God meets his people. It's where God sanctifies his, pre- his people through the preaching and teaching of the word. It's where God encourages his people. It's where God equips his people. So closed churches produce saltless Christians. Closed churches produces outward Christians that are nothing more than inward zombies. Closed churches produces death, and it denies life in Christ. And it judges the word of God as being useless, insufficient, and second class. That is what a closed church does. And this is what 2020 has revealed. And we need to not forget the lessons that we've learned. 
so that as things happen in the future and we you know this is november the 30th at the time of this recording we don't know what the outcomes are going to be of of several things just yet we don't know you know they've got vaccines coming out but eventually when things normalize let us not forget where god in his goodness and his loving kindness has seen fit to reveal our weaknesses let us not forget those weaknesses so that we can repent from them or of them, and so that we can move forward trusting God, trusting in His Word, and having the value for the church that we ought to have. So, dear believer, find a church who's led by men who fear God, led by men who aren't perfect, but they preach the Word of God unapologetically, who sacrificially shepherd their people, and who are open. If your church is closed, find one that's open. Find one that's open. You need the word of God preached to you week in and week out. You need to pray in the corporate setting. You need to sing praises to God and worship to God with your fellow saints. You need to take communion. You need Christ and he is with his gathered church. And to the pastors out there, whom I love dearly, pastors, fellow workers in the field, I would say, be brave. Be a man and open your church. Your people need you. They need the word of God that you preach. They need the fellowship of the saints. They need the ordinary means of grace, and you were called to be a slave of Christ, not a slave to fear. You were called to be a slave of God, not of man. So stand up and fight for the spiritual life of the people that God has entrusted to you. Stand up and fight against tyrants that would tell you strip clubs are necessary and your church isn't. Stand up and fight for the sake of truth. And if you cannot do that, then get out of the pulpit. The pulpit is no place for cowards, but rather for men sold out to Christ no matter the cost. Christ didn't die on the cross and call you to the ministry so that you could cower before the insane rule of dictators while watching the spiritual health of your people wither away. Christ didn't pick up the cross so that you could run away from yours. Dear pastor, feed his sheep and open his church. Well, folks, I hope that today's message was encouraging. I hope that it gave you something to think about, to process, to ponder. And if you find yourself in one of those groups of people who need to fall on your knees and repent before God, then do that. God is faithful to forgive, and in his loving kindness, he will forgive. But we've got to repent um, as the Holy Spirit puts his finger on those places in our lives that we need to repent of. So I hope that this was encouraging. Um, Pastors, ministry leaders, if you're listening, I, I hope that this encouraged you to stand up, to be a man, to take charge, to take care of your people, regardless of the cost to yourself. So, We really appreciate you guys. We thank you for joining us this week. Also, um, if you guys would love to toss a few bucks our way to support the podcast or to support our church plant here in Alaska, you're welcome to do that by going to our Patreon, which is simply uh, patreon.com backslash Jolly Missionaries. Uh, You can do that. You can sign up for a newsletter if you would like to pray for us. We really covet your prayers. We need them. We appreciate them. And we appreciate you guys. And so until next time, Let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.